Welcome back to A Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and this morning I'm delighted to be joined by Tino Callaghan of the Celtic Exchange for a wee wander in paradise. Tino, what a beautiful morning. It's a great morning, spring has sprung, um, it could have been a better morning had things gone a wee bit better yesterday but do you know what, taking a step back, happy enough with the draw and Celtic now have it all on our own hand. This is the big thing for me, you can look at that performance yesterday Tino and go through the disappointment of losing a two goal lead and I think once you've slept on it, you can start pulling some more of the positives from it. I think we speak all season, we've been speaking about Dyson Maeda, dividing opinion. Yeah. The cult hero of the Celtic side. Doesn't matter if he's bald or a, a silver fox, yeah. he's still Dyson. And I'll tell you something, that goal within 30 seconds set us up nicely, didn't it? Nothing wrong with a silver fox, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, 21 seconds, I think. I'm getting there, but <laughs> I'm getting there. 21 seconds. Do you know, we spoke about it, we done our post match. Uh, not long after the final whistle and that incident, that goal, it almost in a microcosm sums up Dyson Maeda's relationship with James Tavernier. Maeda does what he does, he presses, he harries, Tavernier makes a me mess of it and Celtic get a goal and it's something that's happened time after time and yeah, you know, he's an enigma isn't he and we talk about, you know, should Celtic still play Dyson Maeda if you want to move forward, is he, is he the guy for you? But time after time he produces results and actually you can see why managers constantly pick him, whether it's you know Ange, Brendan Rodgers or his national manager. Whenever we're speaking about this fixture in the week leading up to it, Tino, um, a big question is how we're going to deal with the threat of Tavernier. And I think that's the way you deal with him. Get him on the back foot. Yeah, 100%. He's, he is a threat. And, and, you know, we were chatting earlier on there about the fact that, like it or not, you know, you, you need to give him praise in terms of what he does from a, a dead ball situation. And if he gets high, his deliveries can be dangerous. And I think Dyson Maeda just almost completely nullifies that. I can't actually think of a decent cross to have when in yesterday. Maybe I'm wrong, but I can't even picture that. So, yeah, for as much as he does defensively, as offensively, Maeda's a, he's a must pick. He definitely is. And you're a goal up and you're controlling the game. And then we win a penalty. It's something that's quite unique in Scottish football. A goats and handball resulting <laughs> in a penalty, you know. But I'll tell you something, Matt O'Reilly was the coolest guy in the country when he was waiting to take that kick. I mean, that was just class personified, wasn't it? Do you know, I thought he looked a bit nervous. I, I was watching him on the approach, but he's a guy we hear frequently about Matt O'Reilly, how he takes this very holistic approach to, to football and, and life in general. It's meditation, it's, I think it's a bit of yoga, all this kind of stuff. He's, he's quite a unique character. And I, I'm sure he goes through a process of sorts when he's stepping up for a pressure situation like that. But to dink it against England's potential number one, uh, I thought it was real class. And it's not fairly I like, I've got to be honest with you. I do some coaching just with some amateur football teams. And I say to you guys, pick a side, hit it firmly, don't change your mind. And it really does everything the opposite of that, and it's 2-0 Celtic. Yeah, and you know what? Sometimes forgotten, Tino, you know, in games like this, because it, the first half was excellent, I feel, um, is that... Coming up to half time, Joe Hart pulls off two brilliant saves back yep. to back. And you've always always got to mention that because he's been doing it all season. Mm -hmm. We tipped him last week for potential player of the year. You'll have seen that Celtic released their shortlist, various characters involved, Matt O'Reilly, Kyogo, all the usual suspects. And Joe Hart was amongst that and I said he must be in the reckoning because he came under scrutiny. I remember it here against Motherwell, he was poor for a corner which led to was it one each at finished, maybe? Yep. And he was getting a lot of grief at the time. And actually since then, and certainly since he announced his retirement, I think he stepped up dramatically. And I think you could spell there where Callum McGregor's been missing, Cameron Carter Vickers has been missing, and the team has needed leaders. I actually think as a squad, we're a bit short of leaders. But Joe Hart is certainly one of them and he's really stepped up big time. So we're going at half time, Tiro, two nothing up. And I'm there at half time on the bulletin and I'm thinking to myself, right, the next goal. I know it sounds cliched, the next goal is key to this encounter. Now, there's two trains of thought, and I've been obviously watching and listening to everything in the aftermath of the game. <coughs> One train of thought, and this was me after the game, the penalty changes everything, the whole dynamic of the game. But you've also got to look at Celtic's performance and say, you know what, we lost that second half. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the facts are that the penalty kind of changes the momentum, absolutely, but Celtic, as good as the first half was, and it was really good, they just didn't come out. And actually, aside from Adam Eder's goal, there's not a lot to get excited about across that second half, and it was really, you know, a stark contrast. So, yes, the penalty is the, the moment that swings the momentum back to Rangers, but, and, you, and we can debate the merits of it being a penalty, but I do think Celtic had it in their gift to go and hold on to that lead, and I think we failed to do so. Was it a penalty? <laughs> in modern football, maybe, and as a maybe, it's not a definite. 
I think what you've got is a situation, we debated this in our post-match, that when you show anything in slow motion or certainly stills, it's just a very different picture from the reality of what happened. So in real time, <laughs> credit to John Bean isn't forthcoming too much from us, but in real time, I think he's made a really decent call. He's seen the guy, he's very close to it. He's seen Silva go down, not for the first time in the game. And I think he's made the right call. And then VAR shows on stills and slow-mos and different things. And the story changes. And in the modern game, you can certainly be justified in giving a penalty for that. So soft, yes, but you, we've spoken to some referees recently. Whether it's a soft penalty or a hard penalty, it's a penalty. Let us know in the comments section, was that a penalty yesterday? Did the VAR team and John Breton get it right? After that game and the dust has settled, Tino, you can then look at it and say, you know what, had all the ingredients is something that are classic. Brilliant goals, loads of goals, obviously. Uh, the comeback, yeah. the big comeback. You think there's going to be one at the death. Then there's the equaliser and big refereeing calls. But the one thing that really, for me, um, put a blot in the copybook was the missiles being thrown at Celtic's dugout again, Tino. I mean, how can this be tackled? How's it going to stop? <laughs> it's... <laughs> Self-policing would be one, but I'm not sure that's going to happen. The club may come down harder on that. I mean, it, it, it's several times now. You've got Lee Griffiths, Scott Brown was attacked. Mm -hmm. uh, the fans in that corner, when they've been there, have been attacked. And you've had situations, was it Chris Sonner? Neil Lennon was meant to be on punditry and they couldn't guarantee yeah. safety, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I really, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, surely in this day and age with cameras around, you can identify those folk. It's the main stand, isn't it? You shouldn't be able to identify who's done that and take swift action whether as a club they do so or not is a different question absolutely and of course you've got the uh, broken glass in the goal mouth as well Tino when yeah. Joe Hart brought that to the referees attention right half a dozen games I mean it was an opportunity to get a wee bit of light between the two sides but coming away with a draw I think is, is fine I'm okay with that Tino I just think there's a disappointment when you've had the two goal lead how are you feeling going into the last half dozen games I'm feeling good I mean we had to just before we done our post-match, done it with James, my brother, and had a quick chat about the kind of tone, you know, what it was going to be like. And generally speaking, yes, there's a bit of deflation after losing the lead. But when you take a step back, I scored draw at Ibrox, leaving you with your destiny in your own hands. I'd take that all day long. And I think the fact that in these last half dozen games, four of them are here at Celtic Parry mm -hmm. and two away fixtures, I think you take that all day long. The fact that Rangers need to come here and get some sort of result, I think it plays right into our hands. So Tino, we go to Ibrox and we get a 3-3 draw and now all eyes will be focusing on the title fight and 30 years ago up here at Celtic Park it was a different type of fight wasn't it? I mean just round the front there Brian Dempsey came out and uttered those immortal words. I've got to say in terms of media and, and content on YouTube um, I can't remember enjoying a series so much as your series looking back at the takeover. Talk me through that. Uh, do you know it kind of came about through chance and we're going to do a wee bit of follow up a kind of the making of the battle to save Celtic, that's the name of the series. And I need to give credit to a, a fella called Matthew Marr. Matthew is a Celtic author, he's written a book on Celtic's first ever league title way back when. He's Hail Hail History on Twitter. And Matthew dropped me a very casual message on the approaches to the 4th of March, you know, the, the anniversary of that takeover 30 years ago. And just suggested that I might want to speak to some of the figures at that time. He'd been in touch with David Lowe, with Mark McGlone doing some uh, written pieces. He says, maybe there's a, a podcast to be done here. Maybe you want to speak to these guys and, and see what their story is 30 years on. And just on that, I reached out to both of those figures who were you know, very kind with their time and very happy to come on. And it kind of snowballed from there. So Matt McGlone was episode one. Some brilliant stuff, sells for change. David Lowe, the, the financial mastermind behind the whole takeover. Ferguson's right-hand man as such. I then spoke to Jim Orr, guy you know very well. Uh, a very good storyteller. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Jim was part of Save Ourselves, so he was very kind uh, to come on and tell his story. Then you had put me in touch with Tom Grant, part of the old board. Slightly controversial in terms of the general perception is old board bad, everyone else good, everyone yeah. else good. Yeah. Tom is such a nice guy and such a, a Celtic man. Massive Celtic fan. Yes, he's here every other week and you, know, you couldn't get a bigger fan than him. And I think he's in that tricky position, isn't he, where through family means he becomes a director at Celtic. But at a time where he was surrounded by folks who just weren't capable of taking Celtic forward, to be frank about it. But Tom came on and gave us a great insight into you know, his side of things. Then we spoke to Hugh Keevans, again a wee bit controversial. Yeah. Hugh couldn't have been nicer. Such a good guy, such a talented broadcaster. 54 years in the media. Yes, he's got his persona on Radio Clyde and a lot of Celtic fans don't like that. 
But in terms of what he brought to the story and in terms of the, the insight he provided on that, that era, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I think a lot of people will be surprised by the Hugh Keevans episode, Tino. Yeah, do you know, I actually had to convince certain folk we've got quite a, an avid and kind of loyal fan base these days and certain folks said, Tino, I've loved that, you know, parts one to four, great stuff. I can't listen to Keevans. And I had to actually convince folk, I said, listen, do yourself a favour. It's a brilliant episode and I think you'll be surprised by it. And folk had the comments since putting the Hugh Keevans episode out. They absolutely blew up and so many kind words. T towards you, Kevin, and folks surprised by just how warmly he comes across when talking about Celtic. I think Jim Jim Moore has always said that to me that in the early days of Save Ourselves, Hugh Kevins was a massive help, a massive assistance. It got to the point, I think, that had it not been for the fact he was working in the mainstream media himself, yeah. he would have chaired that meeting at Shettleston Halls, wouldn't he? I I'm sure he would have. So Joe Boltrami obviously stepped in, but yeah, so Shug was working for the Scotsman at the time. And he basically said he had carte blanche to go and do a one. They were very, they're Edinburgh based, obviously, and very rugby centric in terms of their sport. So in terms of football, they just said to Hugh Evans, go and do what you need to do. So he had free reign to go and really explore that story. And in those days, you're, you're pre-internet, pre-social media. Um, you couldn't get the word around in the same way that we can do now. And Hugh's reporting at that time was really, really important in keeping the Celtic story front and centre. One one of the big ones. I mean, I've enjoyed them all, of course. You know, I'm a sponge to that <laughs> that period at Celtic. Yeah. But Brian Dempsey, that was a sensational interview. Amazing, and it was Hugh Keevans who put me in touch with Brian very kindly. And uh, you know, of course, we'd love to get Fergus on and, and Michael Kelly. And I have spoke to folks there, and there's potential for those two guys, but nothing concrete. But in terms of the other big, it had to be Brian Dempsey who stood just up there and all those famous words: "The game is over, the rebels have won," and. The, the prospect of getting him was something I was really keen to do because everyone speaks about how engaging he is, how talented a, an orator, orator, whatever the word is. Uh, but a really talented speaker, a really engaging guy. And I think if you watch that episode, you can see you know exactly why people speak so so highly of him. My biggest, not a regret of mine, but I think it's a regret that Celtic couldn't have found a way for Brian Dempsey to be part of what they were doing. He was obviously part of the old board for a small time in 1990. And for whatever reason, him and Fergus just couldn't get on, on board together, so after the takeover, 4th of March 94, Fergus swept out of power and Brian wasn't part of that, and I think that was a loss to Celtic. You know, at that time, reading through the pages of the fanzines, you know, um, at my age, I should have been reading about the brilliance of Paul McStay and all that stuff, but you ended up getting pulled into the, the story about the board and ousting the board, but I often wondered how it affected players, so it was great also that you were able to get Peter Grant in yep. on that series as well. Peter was great and it was important, we were keen to speak to, to one of the players of that time, but importantly a player who was also Celtic minded and if anyone's Celtic minded it's Peter Grant. He was brilliant with his time, Peter played at Celtic between 1984, made his debut at Ibrox in 1984 and was here until 1997. He sort of very temporarily crossed paths with Wim Janssen and Henrik Larsson, but he knew his time was up and he moved on to Norwich, but he had such a good story to tell. And the one thing about Peter Grant, he, by his own admission, not the most talented player here, but such a, a passionate and committed player. And again, that, that comes across in the episode, so it was really enjoyable to speak to him. It does. Anyone who's not tuned in, check out the Celtic Exchange on YouTube. As I say, it's my, my favourite series, Celtic-related series, on the channel. And check out Tino and the boys on the socials as well. All that's left for me to say, join us again tomorrow at 12.30 on a Celtic State of Mind.